Hey, hey, everybody. It's your girl, Morgan Renee Myers, tuning in with you all for another story time with more my. I am on to a new book. I've not finished the last book, or, uh, Trying to Sleep in the Bed You Made. Um, but I wanted to get into something with more depth to it. That's more of a um, fiction type book. I wanted to get into something that um, really talking about something that's really factual. Uh, so I've had this book, heard about it quite a few times, and so I wanted to delve into it. It's called Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to Present, okay? So I want to um, thank you everybody that's tuning in. I want to get into this book, but something about me personally as a reader, when I read, I do like to read the table of contents um, and intros and things like that. And so I'm actually going to do that um, for this book as well. So let's just hop right into it. Um, the opening has a quote by Richard Wright from 1944. It says, when I began working at the Institute, I recall my adolescent dream of becoming a medical research worker. Daily, I saw young white boys and girls receiving instruction in chemistry and medicine that the average black boy or girl could never receive. When I was alone, I wandered and poked my fingers into strange chemicals, watched intricate machines trace red and black lines upon ruled paper. At times, I paused and stared at the walls of the rooms, at the floors, at the wide desk at which the white doctor sat, and I realized with a feeling that I can never quite get used to that I was looking at the world of another race. That's Richard Wright, 1944. Then there's another quote, the wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. And that's from the chief U.S. prosecutor, Robert Jackson, opening statement, uh, Nuremberg Doctors Trial, December 9th, 1946. So uh, yeah, this book, this book gonna get deep and head hard. So let's get into it. Table of contents. You got the intro, the American Janus of Medicine and Race, Part One, a troubling tradition. Chapter One, Southern discomfort, medical exploitation on the plantation. Chapter Two, profitable wonders, antebellum medical experimentation with slaves and freedmen. Chapter Three. Circus Africanus, the popular display of black bodies. Chapter four, the surgical theater, black bodies in the antebellum clinic. Chapter five, the restless dead, anatomical dissection and display. Chapter six, diagnosis, freedom, the civil war, emancipation, and Fendel Sealclair medical research. Chapter seven, a notoriously syphilis-soaked race, what really happened at Tuskegee. Then we have part two, the usual subjects. Chapter eight, the black stork, the eugenic control of African-American reproduction. Chapter nine, nuclear winter, radiation experiments on African-Americans. Chapter 10, cage subjects, research on black prisoners. Chapter 11, the children's crusade, research target young Amer African-Americans. And then we have part three, race, technology, and medicine. Chapter 12, Genetic uh, perdition, the rise of molecular bias. Chapter 13, infection and inequality, infection and inequity, illness as crime. Chapter 14, the age machine, African American martyrs to surgical technology. Chapter 15, Arborant Wars, American bioterrorism targets blacks. And then we have the epilogue, appendix, acknowledgments, notes, bibliography, and index. So let's get into it with the introduction. Again, we are reading medical apartheid the dark history of medical experimentation on black americans from colonial times to present by harriet a washington i already know this book is going to trigger me something serious so i'm gonna take my time with it introduction the american janus of medicine and race science without conscience is the soul's perdition frank 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 rabbitless pen pentagrew I gotta travel more. I'm not uh, well versed in some of these foreign names. I'll tell you that. On a sylvan stretch of New York's uh, pa Patrician Upperfield Avenue, just across from the New York Academy of Medicine, a colossus in in marble, August inscriptions, and a base relief. Oh Lord, this one of the books I really need a dictionary for because it's already starting out. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so I might I might be rereading this. A base relief, caduceus grace, what? Cadacis? Oh God, let me start over. On a silver stretch of New York's 
Patrician Upper Fifth Avenue, just across the New York Academy of Medicine, a Colossus in Marble, August Inscription, and a Bass Relief, Caduceus Grace, a Memorial Bordering Central Park. Is there not an easy way to say that? These laurels venerate the surgeon James Marion Sims, M.D., as a selfless benefactor of women. Nor is this only... Nor is this only statutory erected in honor of Dr. Sims' marble monuments to his skill, benevolence, and humanity guard his native South Carolina State House, its medical school, the Alabama Capitol grounds, and a French hospital. In the mid-19th century, Dr. Sims dedicated his career to the care and cure of women's disorders and opened the, first, and opened the nation's first hospital for women in New York City. He attended French he attended French royalty. His Grecian, his Grecian visage inspired oil portraits. In 1875, he was elected president of the American Medical Association. Hospitals still bear his name, including a West African hospital uh, that utilizes the eponymous gynecolo gynecological instruments that he first invented for surgeries upon black female slaves in the 1840s. But this benevolent image, image vies with the detached Marion Sims portrayed in Robert Tom's J. Marion Sims gynecologic surgeon in oral representation of an experimental surgery upon his powerless slave Betsy. Sims stands aloof, arms folded, one hand holding a metroscope, the forerunner of the speculum, and he regards the kneeling woman in a coolly evaluative medical gaze. His tie and morning coat contrast with her simple servant's dress, head rag, and bare feet. The painting, commissioned and distributed by the Park Davis Pharmaceutical House more than a century after the surgery as one of its A History of Medicine and Picture series, takes telling liberties with the historical facts. Tom portrays Betsy as a fully clothed, calm slave woman who kneels complacently on a small table and modestly raised to her breast before a trio of white male physicians. Two other slave women peer around a sheet, apparently hung for modesty's sake, in a childlike display of curiosity. The Inaka's tableau could hardly differ more from the gruesome reality in which each surgical scene was a violent struggle between slaves and physicians, and each woman's body was a bloody battleground. Each naked, unanesthesia slave woman had to be forcibly restrained by other physicians through her shrieks of agony as Sims determinedly sliced, then sutured her genitalia. The other doctors who could fled when they could bear the horrific scenes no longer. It then fell to the women to restrain one another. I wanted to reproduce Tom's painting on the cover of this book, or at least in the text, but when I asked permission of his copyright holder, Pfizer Inc., the company insisted on reviewing the entire manuscript of this book before making a decision. As an independent scholar, I could not acquiesce to this, and I used another cover image. When I renewed my request to use the image within the text, Pfizer agreed to base his decision upon reading this chapter and an outline of the book. The Pfizer executives apparently were uncomfortable with what they read because they refused to grant permission to re reproduce this telling image or even respond to my query after I supplied the requested chapter and outline. This act of censorship exemplifies the barriers some choose to erect in order to veil the history of unconscionable medical research with blacks. Betsy's voice had been silenced by history, but as one reads Sims's biographers and his own memoirs, a haughty, self-observed researcher emerges, a man who bought black women slaves and addicted them to morphine in order to perform dozens of exquisitely painful, distressingly intimate vaginal surgeries. Not until he had experimented with his surgeries on Betsy and her fellow slaves for years did Sims essay to cure white women. Was Sims a savior or a sadist? It depends, I suppose, on the color of the women you ask. Marion Sims epitomizes the two faces, one benign, one me 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 of, uh, malevolent of, of American medical research. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhumane. In 1965, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke these words in Montgomery, Alabama at the end of the Selma to Montgomery March that had been attended by the black and white physicians of the Medical Committee for Human Rights. King had invited the doctors not only to give medical support to injured uh, marchers, but also to witness the abuse suffered at the hands of segregationists. With these almost unnoticed words, 
King ushered in a new era in the civil rights because as delegate to Congress, Donna Christian Christian, MD, chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust, has declared health disparities are the civil rights issue of the 21st century. Thus, Dr. King's alarm over racial health injustice was prescient, and we, and where he alive today, his concern will be redoubled. Mounting evidence of the racial health divide confronts us everywhere we look, from double black infant death rates to African-American life experiences that fall years behind whites. Infant mortality of African-Americans is twice that of whites, and black babies born in more racially segregated cities have higher rates of mortality. The life expectancy of African-Americans is as much as six years less than that of whites. Old measures of health not only have failed to improve significantly, but have stayed the same. Some have even worsened. Mainstream newspapers and magazines often report disease in an ethnocentric manner that shrouds its true cost among African Americans. For example, despite the heavy emphasis on genetic ailments among blacks, fewer than 0.5% of black deaths, that's less than one death in 200, can be attributed to hereditary disorders such as sickle cell anemia. A closer look at the troubling numbers reveals that blacks are dying not of an exotic incurable poorly understood illnesses nor of genetic diseases that target only them but rather from common ailments that are more often prevented and treated among whites than among blacks three times as many african americans were diagnosed with diabetes in 1993 as in 1963. this rate is nearly twice that of white americans and is sorely misunderstood the real black diabetes rate is probably double that of white. As with most chronic diseases, African Americans suffer more complications, including limb loss, blindness, kidney disease, and terminal heart disease. Cancer, the nation's second greatest killer, is diagnosed later in blacks and carries off predominantly more African Americans than whites. African Americans suffer the nation's highest rate of cancer and cancer death. The distortion of African American date rates illustrated by the common dismissal of black women's breast cancer risk as lower than white women. This, char this characterization implies that black women are at low risk for breast cancer, but their risk is only slightly lower because the estimated lifetime risk of developing breast cancer is 10 per 100 for white women born in 1980 and 7 per 100 for black women born that year. Moreover, this lower risk of developing breast cancer is overshadowed by blacks much higher risk of dying from it. 86% of white women with breast cancer are alive five years later. Only 71% of black women survive that long. A black woman is 2.2 times as likely as a white woman to die of breast cancer. Black women have been undergoing mammograms at the same rate as white women, but are more likely to receive poorer quality screening, which may not detect a cancer in time for a cure. A black woman is also more likely to develop her cancer before age 40, too early for recommended mammograms to catch it, and black women are diagnosed at a more advanced stage than either Hispanic or white breast cancer patients. Black cancer patients have a worse overall prognosis and a worse prognosis at each stage. Black men have the nation's highest rates of developing and dying from prostate and lung cancers. Despite its image and a, this Despite its image as a disease that affects middle-aged white men, heart disease claims 50% more African Americans than whites, and African Americans die from heart attacks at a higher rate than whites. African Americans are more likely to develop serious liver ailments, such as hepatitis C, the chief cause of liver transplants. They are also more likely to die from liver disease, not because of any inherent racial susceptibility, but because blacks are less likely to receive aggressive treatment with drugs such as interferon or life-saving liver transplant. Even the legion of newest illnesses, emerging disease such as HIV and AIDS and hepatitis C, kills blacks at a much higher rate than whites. AIDS, the scourge of our time, has become a disease of people of color here and abroad. 49% of HIV-infected uh, uh, Americans are African Americans, and 86% of children with AIDS are African American or Hispanic. Blacks are 10 times as likely to develop AIDS as whites. Mental ailments are destroying blacks as well. Black women suffer the highest rates of straight stress and major depression in the nation, and suicide rates soar 200% among young black men within just 20 years. These are dire statistics born of complex interactions among unhealthy environments, social pressures and limitations, 
lifestyle factors and limited access to health care including very limited access to cutting edge therapeutic medical research that is meant to help treat or cure a patient with a disorder okay sorry um my camera hat went off over here um so let me go back these are dire statistics born of complex interactions among unhealthy environments social pressures and limitations lifestyle factors and limited access to health care including very limited access to cutting edge therapeutic medical research that is meant to help treat or cure a patient with a disorder but this dearth of therapeutic research is accompanied by a plethora of non-therapeutic research with african americans which is meant to investigate medical issues excuse me for the benefit of future patients or of medical knowledge and this brings us to the subject of this book which documents a particular a peculiar type of injustice in health the troubled history of medical experimentation with african americans and the resulting behavioral fallout that causes researchers and african americans to view each other through jaundiced eyes in his 1909 preface to the doctor's dilemma george bernard shaw scathingly observed the tragedy of illness at present is that it delivers you helplessly into the hands of a profession which you deeply mistrust he could have been speaking for contemporary african americans because studies and surveys repeatedly confirm that no other group as deeply mistrusts the american medical system especially medical research the problem is growing as the wall street journal observed several years back it hasn't been a good time for scientists who experiment on people or the people they experiment on this is a masterpiece of understatement, especially if you consider the recent history of medical research with African Americans. The Office for Protection from Research Risk, or the OPRR, has been busily investigating abuses at more than 60 research centers, um, including experimentation-related deaths at Premier, uh, Premier University from Columbia to California. Another important subset of human subject abuse has been scientific fraud wherein scientists from the university of south carolina to mit have also been found to have lied through falsified data or fictitious research agendas agendas often in the service of research that abuse black americans within recent years the oprr has also suspended research at such revered universities as alabama pennsylvania duke yale and even john hopkins many studies enrolled only or principally african americans although some included a, a smattering of Hispanics. Some research studies specifically excluded white subjects according to the terms of their official protocols, the federally required plans that detail how research studies are conducted. However, in other human medical experiences, experiments, the recruitment of blacks and the poor is a tacit feature of the study because they recruit subjects from heavily black inner city areas that tend to surround American teaching hospitals. American University Research Centers have historically been located in inner city areas and accordingly a disproportionate number of these abuses have involved experiments with African Americans. Share, hold on real quick. My video on Instagram stopped. I wonder if it's because what I'm talking about or another reason. second y'all sorry I'm trying to make sure it upload what it did record okay the subjects were given experimental vaccines known to have unacceptably high lethality were enrolled in experiments without their consent or knowledge, were subjected to super, super, sur, hold on, let me slow down, surreptitious surgical and medical procedures while unconscious, injected with toxic substances, deliberately monitored rather than treated for deadly ailments, excluded from life saving treatments, or secretly farmed for sera or tissues that were used to perfect technologies such as infectious disease tests. A few African-American medical institutions have suffered their own run-ins with federal oversight agencies concerned about how they treated their own subjects, research subjects. But the considerable concern raised by governmental oversight agency has been dwarfed by the periodic hue and cry raised in the popular press. 
the news media seize upon and decry new experimental abuses with regularity. Moreover, it is newspapers, not research oversight organizations, that have been instrumental in unveiling and ending irregious ir abuses from the Tuskegee syphilis study in the 1970s to the 1996 jailing of four black mothers who were unwitting research student subjects in South Carolina to the 1998 infusion of four black New York City boys with the cardiotoxic drug fenfluramine. However, newspapers and magazines have given such abuses episodic rather than analytic treatment, expending their outrage, then falling silent to the next wave of research deaths, missing consent forms, or unwitting subjects steals headlines. Subjects are often identified not as black, but using coded references as the urban poor, social, socioeconomically disadvantaged, or inner city residents. This episodic approach treats the exploitation of black experimental subjects as isolated events so that even while the repeated reports buttress widespread distress of medical research, these stories fail to discern the stubborn and illuminating patterns characterizing the medical abuse of African Americans. In fact, the news media often fail to perceive unethical experimentation, even as they write about it. Scientists promulgate, prom, promulgate novel drugs and technologies such as norplant use among adolescents and psychosurgery for rioters as new therapies that are necessarily extreme remedies. But despite the treatment, untried nature and the vulnerability of their subjects, the news media often swallows such euphemistic labels as breakthrough and new therapy whole. Research is an utterly essential and desirable component of treatment, but a subject must be aware that they are participating, must be informed, must consent, and must be allowed to weigh the possible risks and benefits. As this book will show, these conditions are only haphazardly met or not at all when the subjects are African American. A historical vacuum. The experimental exploitation of African Americans is not a, an issue of the last decade or even the past few decades. Dangerous, involuntary, and non therapeutic experimentation upon African Americans has been practiced widely and documented extensively at least since the 18th century. Attempts to understand the distrust this history generates are confused and distorted because few know its facts beyond a few off-sided experimental outrages, notably the Tuskegee syphilis study. History of medicine courses, medical museums, and even much medical scholarship leave one unaware of the long tragic history of medical research with African Americans. There are fine books that address more general issues in the history of African Americans in medicine. These include The History of the Negro in Medicine by Herbert M. Marias, Making a Place for Ourselves by Vanessa Northington Gamble, M.D., and The Sweepingly Ambitious an American Health Dilemma by Drs. Linda Clayton and Michael Byrd. Other works deal with discrete instances of African American experimental exploitation, such as James Jones' Bad Blood and Susan M. Reverby's Tuskegee's Truth, The Plutonium Files. Uh, oh, simple. Oh, sorry. Let me go back. Uh, other works deal with discrete instances of African American experimental exploitation, such as James Jones' Bad Blood and Susan M. Reverby's Tuskegee's Truth. The Plutonium Files by Eileen Wilson meticulously details government radiation experiments in a gripping expose. Bones in the Basement by Robert Blakely and Judith Harrington documents the archaeological evidence that reveal how the Medical College of Georgia used stolen African American bodies for physician training. Alan Hornblum's Acres of Skin chronicles experimentation in Philadelphia's Holmesburg prison complex. And The Treatment by Martha Stevens does the same with Cincinnati's radiation experiments. Most of the abuses detailed in these books targeted African Americans. Killing the Black Body by Dorothy Roberts includes research in its examination of the reproductive constraints on African American women in a historical context, and Charlotte M. Fett's Working Cures and Todd L. Savage's Medicine and Slavery are seminal histories of antebellum medicine that discuss research issues, but not exclusively. A few scholars have devoted books to research with blacks abroad, such as Clarence Lutain's Fine, Hitler's Black Victims, Wolfgang U. Eckert's Medicine and Colonial Imperialism on Medical Colonialism in Germany's African Holdings, and Jan Bart Gerald, Gerald Hero, Hero's 
on the German medical abuse of Nambia's hero, Herero people. But none of the works listed above attempt anything like a comprehensive history of the racial research wars. There have been no inclusive treatments of African-American research and only a few books on discrete aspects of that history, focusing on research in a single prison, a single archaeological discovery of African-American bones in a medical school basement, a single experiment with syphilitic men, or a single radiation experiment. Why? History is written by the victors, warned Churchill, and a Nigerian proverb issues a similar caveat, don't let the lion tell the giraffe story. The history of medicine has been written by medical professionals and so reflects their points of view. The experimental suffering of black Americans has taken many forms. Fear, profound deception, psychological trauma, pain, injection with deadly agents, disfigurement, crippling, chronic illness, undignified display, intractable pain, stolen fertility, and death. None reflect well upon their medical practitioners, so this experimental abuse often has been downplayed or misrepresented as medical um, so none of this reflect well on medical practitioners. So this experimental abuse often has been downplayed or misrepresented as therapy in the medical and popular literature. This book reveals these tendencies as well as the lack of objectivity and sensitivity with which African-American fears are often greeted and the social and cultural reasons for the lack of common ground. The slave appropriated by physicians for physical experimental surgeries the impoverished clinic patient operated upon to devise or demonstrate a surgical technique, the sharecropper whose body is spirited from the morgue for dissection, the young girl whose fertility is stolen via an untested contraceptive technique, or a Mississippi appendectomy, involuntary sterilization. The soldiers, prisoners, and children who find themselves without options when government physicians foist novel medications and techniques upon those with little legal protection all these African Americans and many more have found themselves voiceless as medical lions have chosen to have chosen to present this research in a bower in a bowlerized manner. I had to control a little length there. I'm not gonna be able to finish it off because I gotta head into work soon, but I'm gonna do what I can. The oral histories and medical abuse voiced by African Americans are often dismissed as mythological but without objective proof of this label. African Americans' personal stories and family histories of abuse have rarely surfaced in the medical literature or in popular literature. This is not surprising because African Americans were not well represented in the canons until fairly recently. Why should we give the physicians' medical narratives more cre uh, credence than the numerous contention of slaves, sharecroppers, and contemporary African Americans that have been subjected to abusive medical research? Until now, the discussion has suffered greatly from our Western literary bias, which encourages us to believe planters and physicians writing about the health and medical issues of African Americans, but to give insufficient weight to a rich oral history passed down by African Americans, a history that has preserved the memory of medical abuses. We quite logically see medical authorities to medical experts, but this book will illustrate how race, culture, and economics have trumped medical and scientific truth at every turn. It will make the case that physicians had every motive to skew natives, uh, narratives against their black subjects, not because they were especially racist or unfair, although many were, but because the culture of American medicine was mirrored, has mirrored the larger culture that encompassed enslavement, segregation, and less dramatic forms of racial inequality, inequity. The bias against African American medical narratives emanates from culture and politics, including the Western literary bias against oral history. Because slaves were forbidden to read in segregated educational institutions, perpetrated illiteracy and undereducation, black Americans' contributions to the historical understanding of their role in American medicine were dwarfed or silenced. Finally, physicians' accounts carefully inculcated beliefs about black fearlessness, prejudicelessness, emotional instability, and a tendency toward falsehoods that help to discount claims of abuse. The resulting loose Luke Kine in American medical history feeds erroneous assumptions about black medical wariness. An almost innate resistance to all medical research is ascribed to all African Americans. Often, the fear of becoming an abused, unwitting subject is laid to one signal instance of abuse, the Tuskegee syphilis study, rather than to a centuries-long history of such abuse. Fortunately, the facts recorded by researchers and scientists themselves in medical journals, texts, speeches, and memoirs, butchers, 
African American claims for several reasons. Until three or four decades ago, these researchers were speaking only to their like-minded peers, other whites, usually male and rarely of the lower class. They could afford to be framed. Blacks were barred from many medical schools and training programs, and newspaper and magazine reporters rarely read the medical publications pursued as usually as specially perused by specially trained medical men of means. There was very little danger any blacks could read medical accounts because in the antebellum period, black literacy was banned by law and their literacy persisted long beyond slavery. Therefore, a doctor could be open about buying slaves for experiments or locating or moving hospitals to areas where blacks furnished bodies for experimentation and dissection. Public health service physician Thomas Murrell could brashly insist in the 1940s the future of the Negro lies more in the research laboratory than in the schools. When diseased, he should be registered and forced to take treatment before he offers his diseased mind and body on the altar of academic and professional education. Even more recently, the segregated nature of U.S. medical training emboldened some physicians to speak with candor of misusing black subjects. It was cheaper to use niggers than cats because they were everywhere and cheap experimental animals. Near surgeon Harry Bailey, M.D., reminisced in a 1960s speech he delivered while at Tulane Medical School. But as societal attitudes changed, so did physician reticence, and most became more circumspect. However, as late as 1995, radiation scientist Clarence Lushbaugh, MD, explained that he and his partner, Eugene Sagner, MD, chose slum patients as radiation subjects because those persons don't have any money and they're black and they're poorly washed. This book will document numerous instances of such shocking frankness on the part of white researchers and physicians when they thought that nobody outside of their peer group was listening. In the course of explaining what constitutes exploitive experimentation, medical apartheid will explain the meaning and nature of informed consent and the differences between therapeutic and non-therapeutic research. It, it traces the delicate balance between experimental risk and benefit because symbiosis, not complete freedom from harm, is the therapeutic goal, a goal that often eludes African Americans. The individual chapters also supply um, general background on how experimental practices evolved over the period covered in this book and how laws and institutional review boards now protect volunteers albeit still imperfectly. All right, so I'll end there with the top of uh, chapter 11 uh, coming to finding the truth in plain sight segment. So I'll tune in with you guys again soon for medical apartheid, the dark history of medical experimentation on black Africans from colonial times to present by Harriet A. Washington. Thank you for tuning in. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's uh, my name, Morgan Myers, M-Y-E-R-S. And you can also type in Storytime with more of mine, and you'll see my playlist of all my previous readings as well as new ones. All right, thank y'all for tuning in. Have a good day. Peace.